Embracing Diversity. This is our dialogue series. We are back this year in 2020. Tonight, we are going to be covering the COVID pandemic and talking about various aspects of it. Just to start us off, there are some statistics that I want you all to know. This is 2022 and January 22, the first month of the year. And already we have 5.5 million people who have died from coronavirus, COVID-19 worldwide. This is since it started, of course in uh, March of 2020. And in the US, about 62.6 people uh, in the uh, population of the US are fully vaccinated and the others are not. There have been, let's see, in the, so in the world, 5.5 million deaths in the US, as of January 23, 2022, the New York Times reports that there have been 866,000 deaths. That's in the US. As a hospital chaplain, I actually can say that it pains me to stand outside of a room in um, our critical care unit at the hospital where I work. I, there, I, because I'm not an essential worker, I don't have to go into the rooms. I'm not required to do that, but I can stand at the windows, at the doors, and I see patients struggling to breathe. And it just pains me to see that. Many of the people, the patients coming in are unvaccinated. I have several panelists on here with me tonight. Again, this is Embracing Diversity, our dialogue series. I have two physicians on here with me tonight and two other panelists. And uh, we may have a few other panelists join us as we go along. So let's get started. Again, my name is Reverend Vicki Hughes. I'm the host and facilitator for this evening and for this dialogue series. I want to just be bold and throw out a question to my panelists. Um, whoever uh, feels comfortable answering this, go ahead. Um, my question is, are you vaccinated um, and, and or boosted? And also I want you to tell us why or why not. And as you start talking, please introduce yourselves. Just let us know um, your name. Um, if you don't wanna say the city where you live, give us the state and also what your occupation is. Anyone can start. I'll start. I'm Dr. Francis Ferguson. I'm an internal medicine physician in Albany, Georgia. I work in a large federally qualified community health center. And I am definitely vaccinated. I've had birth my, both my vaccines. I am boosted. And I'm in vaccinated. I am vaccinated primarily not for myself, but for my community, for my patients, uh, for my children because vaccination is not about the individual. It's not about me. Vaccinations are about uh, the community. We want to live in a community. You have to get vaccinated to protect your community. Just like a farmer vaccinates his entire herd of cows to protect the herd. It's not about the individual patient so, or the individual cow. So regardless of what I feel about vaccines, I got vaccinated because I didn't want to be responsible for putting anyone in the hospital or for causing their death because I didn't get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Who, anybody want to go next? I'll, I'll jump in. I'm Dr. Nina Everett. I'm an internist from Maryland. I am the chief medical officer for a health plan um, that serves Medicaid recipients in my state. And I absolutely am vaccinated and co-signed what Dr. Ferguson said, um, because certainly it's about the community, but also it's about me. It's about my family. Um, I have elderly parents who I interact with and come and go all the time. And I want to make sure that I'm not bringing home anything. Um, I certainly find that it's uh, my responsibility also to lead, lead by example. And so that if I'm asking our health plan recipients to get vaccinated, I need to be able to say that, yes, I did it as well. Great. Thank you, Dr. Everett. And just so for the audience and, and other panelists, I just wanted you all to know that 
both of these physicians on tonight, um, they graduated from the same medical school. I just found that out tonight. They were both referred to me by one of my college roommates, Dr. Karen uh, Smith um, Wells. And um, she uh, referred me to both of these people. They, they uh, actually all three of them went to medical school together. So um, thank you uh, physicians for letting us know. I, we'll hear a lot more from you as, as we go along. Uh, anybody else want to share if they're vaccinated or not? Sure. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Vernon Comer. Uh, I am a Morehouse grad and actually one of uh, Reverend Hughes' classmates uh, from Morehouse, but Matt Spellman, of course. But um, <clears throat> I am vaccinated, um, vaccinated and boosted. Um, and myself and my family um, had COVID in 2020 before that was a vaccine. So <clears throat> anything that we could do to sort of mitigate catching it again, because it's not a fun experience. Um, you know, thank God we did not have to go to the hospital um, or receive any sustained medical treatment. But um, since 2020, I've lost uh, several friends and family. I mean, at one point, I was going to funerals every month um, <laughs> behind COVID before the vaccine. Um, so, yeah, I'm vaccinated, um, as the doctor said, for me, but also for the community. And uh, Dr. Ferguson, love your um, Ask Your Internist video. Awesome. Totally awesome. Hey, I'm uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Richard Curry. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana, a doctoral candidate. Hopefully, I'm in my dissertation uh, about to finish in about three more weeks, hopefully. Praise God. And, but I'm a pastor in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, uh, I pastor in a, uh, in an urban area, and uh, I am vaccine. I'm vaccinated, rather, and boosted. And uh, I just feel it's a responsibility. Uh, to be out front, and certainly I can't ask people to do what I'm not willing to do. And so, again, I want to show our community that uh, it is the right thing to do uh, in order for us to live. Thank you, Richard. And I, I look forward to hearing more from you during the dialogue. I know, um, you know, as I shared with everybody what we'd like to talk about tonight, one of the things we'll be talking about the spiritual aspect of this entire pandemic. So I look sure. forward to hearing from you and it's Reverend Curry. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Reverend Curry. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. It looks like um, two more people have joined us, either Kim or Valerie. We're just sharing if we are vaccinated or not, boosted or not, and, and why you chose to, to do so if you did or why, why you didn't. I did. I initially was told not to by my rheumatologist, but she very quickly said, please do it quicker uh, rather than later. Um, so, yes, I, I have. I am all three. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Valerie. Hi, my name is Valerie Leonard from Chicago. And yes, I am vaccinated. Um, I I'm just one of those people I try, I'm not always, but I try to be a compliant patient. Um, I've gotten vaccinations and shots all my life. This just seems like a, a natural for me to do. And don't think that I wasn't scared, um, given a lot of the information, true and false, going on around there and, and given my age and all that good stuff. But I erred on the side of caution. I'm like, I'm darned if I do, darned if I don't, I may as well do. So I have uh, the vaccination as well as three, yeah, three boosters now. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, oh, yeah, okay. yeah in, Chicago, in Chicago, uh, we've had to go through three rounds Shall say, um, in of Illinois, we've gone through three rounds of COVID vaccinations. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. So I think everyone has talked at least once. And let's see, um, Valerie, did you tell us what um, tell us what you do for a living? Sure, I am the founder of nonprofit Utopia, 
we are the ideal community for emerging nonprofit leaders. And our thing is to train the next generation of nonprofit leaders, hopefully ethical nonprofit leaders. And we do that through an online community, coaching, and consulting. Okay, thank you. Okay, so next, uh, I want to, hopefully my, my tech person can hear me. We have a new tech person. His name is Jay Crowder, and he is behind the scenes. Hopefully he can hear me. This is our first time together. So I he has a short video clip, and I panelists and viewers, if you would please listen to this short video clip. This is from the American College of Physicians, and our panelist, Dr. Frances Ferguson, is the one speaking. Um, it's just a very short clip, and then I'll, I'll be asking her other questions about things she said in the video, but I just wanted to play this one first. Jay. Vaccines for the last 20 or 30 years or so. This did not start in December of 2020. All they had to do was plug in the genetic information for SARS-CoV-2. They already knew what SARS looked like. They already knew what MERS looked like. They're both cousins of, of this current virus. They already knew what to do. They had already tested vaccines and other clinical trials for influenza and rabies and other things. All they had to do was just plug it in. So as far as that goes, I don't really have any concerns with that anymore. The way we conduct clinical research now, the safety protocols that we have in place, the fact that you can't just do research on people any kind of way you want to. I mean, and around the world, the way clinical research is conducted has been developed to prevent the type of thing that happened in the Tuskegee studies. When I looked to see who had done the research, there's a young lady named Kismikia Corbett, who was one of the original scientific leads on Moderna at the NIH. You know, and I like to tell my patients that African-American woman help develop this vaccine. You have a right to want valid answers. There's so much stuff out there. You should not just rush into taking a vaccine or any medicine if you are uncertain about that medicine. It's okay to be concerned and to have questions. You know, as physicians, we're not here to judge you because of that. I don't like shots. I am a baby when it comes to shots. I took my friend with me to hold my hand. I got on board with the COVID vaccine because I felt like the risk of having COVID is a much greater risk, one, of developing COVID, and two, of having some serious symptoms and side effects from it compared to having the vaccine. I looked at what the FDA looked at. It changed my, my heart completely. Okay, so he, he shared a lot more than I thought he was going to. So that was from the various parts of this of this short video. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson, um, for that video and also for allowing uh, my tech person to share some of the uh, some video clips from it. So after watching that video, you know, I want us to to start just talking about this fear, this rebellion. A lot of people are choosing not to get the vaccine. So uh, let's talk about that. Who wants to, um, you know, start the conversation off? What? Why are people not wanting to get vaccinated, and what can we do to help alleviate their fears and or whatever else they're thinking about when they're deciding not to get vaccinated? What, what message do you all have for the, those people? Um, well, what I have found for for the majority of patients who come to me who don't want to get vaccinated, it's because of misinformation, things that they have heard, um, things that they heard on uh, or they saw on Facebook, stuff the neighbor down the street said, um, stuff that most of the time is just really incorrect that you can correct for them. I had a young woman who came to me and said that uh, she didn't want the vaccine because it had radiator fluid in it. And, you know, I asked her, why, why would you say that? It doesn't have radiator. And she brought me proof. She had been on the internet and she got all the ingredients to um, the COVID vaccines. And she said, see, this right here, polyethylene glycol, that's radiator fluid. And I said, you know what? I appreciate the research that you have done and the trouble that you took to bring it to me. But polyethylene glycol is not radiator fluid. That is a simple lipid that's found in enemas and laxatives that we all take probably. 
I said, you are confusing polyethylene glycol with ethylene glycol, which is a substance in radiator fluid. It's not even radiator fluid. It's like saying flour is a cake and flour is not a cake. And so, you know, and again, I explained to her, you can have ingredients, if you are a chemist, you understand this, or a physician or scientist of any sort, you can have some of the same elements in something and make two different things just by changing one property, such as H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. H2O is water, but we don't drink hydrogen peroxide. We don't water our plants with it and we'll probably kill them if, if we did. So people go out on the internet, they find things that they really don't understand. I don't understand all, all chemistry. So you can't give me a chemical formula sometimes and expect me to understand what it is. So we can't expect people to understand things that they're having to pull off the internet because they're getting such mix, mixed signals from their doctors, from the CDCs, from the FDA. People don't know what to think or who to trust. So they trust themselves. And they go out there on the World Wide Web. As I say, they can, they can run down any rabbit hole that they want to, whether you believe in vaccines or not, whether you believe COVID is a hoax or not, you can find a rabbit hole that will support your uh, belief. So I think the, the biggest problem is the misinformation uh, that people are getting. I, I would add to that is that not only the misinformation, but uh, the the entire process from the beginning. Uh, it kind of goes back to the Trump administration, how you know it was it was it was uh, packaged. I just didn't people, want to bring that up. Yeah, well, I'm, I'll bring it up, and and it started there, and I think it's important, especially in the African African American community. Uh, in the urban areas where uh, there is trust factors uh, with with politics and things of like that. And then it was so politicized, yeah. uh, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, you know. And so when I talk to people, and mostly younger people, we don't trust what's going on. And uh, and so, you know, I try to educate them, and, you know, and, you know, I know we probably shared that story as well, where, well, look, we all had a booster to go to school, you know. Right. Your kids have to have shots to go to school. It's the same thing. And so, you know, but it is, it's a trust factor um, with with how this whole thing was rolled out. I think yeah, I, I just, oh, go ahead. You go. Yeah, I was just saying trust is an issue. I think politics are an issue, but I think, too, the politicians and other people with agendas to grind tapped into our spiritual and religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear people say that they're not going to get the shot because it's the Antichrist uh, coming, it's the mark of the beast, yeah. you, you know, that seems, you know, really, really ridiculous. But there's some people who are so into their religious beliefs and don't read the Bible per se. <laughs> <laughs> and they're relying on um, people that they trust who are misleading them, you know, along religious lines as well. So Absolutely. I had a patient who would tell me God told her not to take the vaccine. And I asked her, so do you know what God's voice sound like? How often do you talk to God? Do you pray every day to him? Do you, do you ask him whether it's okay to drink the liquor you were drinking last night or the, or the, the caffeine you're drinking? Do you pray and ask him every time you go to a club or get in your car? How do you know what God sounds like? Do you go to church every Sunday? So when they, you know, they want to throw that on me, I want to know, do you really have a relationship with God? And then I'll further tell them there are three things in our head. We got our voice in our head. We got God's voice in there and we got the devil's voice in there. And every voice that you hear in your head is not God mm. speaking to you. And you need to sure. figure out which one of those voices is speaking to mm. you and not attribute everything to God because that's what you want to people to believe. You know, I, I definitely think it's interesting. And I want to say, I think that's an amazing video because, again, it really gets to the heart of the issues and it speaks in a language that patients, people understand. What it really amazes me, again, with the misinformation is how people take information from just any old body. 
And so I always say, you know, who, where did you hear that? Oh, your cousin's friend's sister's child told you that, or just, I saw it on the internet or just all kinds of weird places. And I say, okay, when your car is broken, where do you go to get it fixed? You go to a mechanic. You don't go to the person at 7-Eleven. You don't listen to somebody on the street. You have to figure out who you trust and go to someone reputable. So when I'm going back and forth, because many people I know have chosen not to be vaccinated. And I'm like, I'm a, I'm a physician. So if you know, you've know you trusted me on everything else, you're calling me up. What about this? What about that? So now I'm trying to share information that is going to help you make an informed decision. You're like, no, no, no. I'm going to listen to my brother's friend's right. child. And I just really um, don't understand that. But again, speaking to people in a language that they can understand and referring them to a trusted health professional, certainly for people of color, I think goes a long way um, to break down the myths, the misinformation, you know, the internet, I mean, all kinds of things, the chip in the arms. So again, incredible people being vaccinated and boosted and sharing that to show you, you didn't grow ahead, nothing sticks to your arm, I think will go a long way to addressing people's concerns. One of the, um, the more interesting things that I sort of hear and I'm hearing more, um, and I, I believe in alternative medicine and other things to try, but, um, and I actually found this article, but I've been hearing this name um, from some of my interesting friends, um, Dr. Joseph Mercola. Uh, I don't know if any of you all have heard of him, but he's an osteopath and an alternative medicine provider. And actually, according to an article in the New York Times, um, he is one of the leading um, spreaders of coronavirus misinformation wow. in the country. And, uh, you know, part of the thing with, you know, some of the proponents that I know, some of my uh, interesting friends, um, and, you know, well, Dr. McCullough says this, that, and the other, and uh, he's got these supplements, and I'm like, ah, wait a minute now. So he's profiting off of your fear. And I'm like, okay, so you don't see, you don't get that, that yes, I, I do understand alternative medicine, and yes, you do need to do your research, but um, he's one that has just really popped up and been, he's, I hear that name um, pretty regularly and, um, and it's like, well, I'll go to his website and I'll look and I'll read, but then it's like, mm, okay, some of it sounds good, but then he sort of veers off and a lot of, you know, and some of the stuff is political as well. But um, I just wanted to mention Dr. Mercola's name as one of those folks who's a leading spreader of misinformation. And it's, it's interesting how people are willing to take supplements that contain proprietary blends. It's like, what is that? A proprietary blend. You could be eating, I'm sorry to say, you could be eating cat poop. You don't know what's in a proprietary blend, but people are willing to take it. Now, here we have a vaccine that has been researched and researched and gone through vigorous um, uh, evaluations and whatnot. You've got a list of every single thing that's in it, but you'd rather go take a supplement that you have no idea what is in it just because doctor whoever said it was okay. That's, that's what amazes me all the time. Or I have patients who don't want to take a medicine, but yet they have a bag full of herbal supplements. You don't want to put one blood pressure pill in your mouth that I'm telling you is safe, but you'll go take 12 vitamins that are not doing anything for you. People, people are kind of amazing like that, to say the least. That's an interesting word, <laughs> Dr. Ferguson. They're amazing. <laughs> okay, yeah. I, I, I lost connection for a minute, so I, I, it looks like you all kept the conversation going. So you're still talk, it sounds like you're still talking about why people aren't getting wanting to get vaccinated. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, more or less. Um, I want to say, since you mentioned the political issue, the way the way I saw it was the past administration pushed the vaccine through Operation Warp Speed. You know, the, but but the agenda, the ultimate agenda really was not to get a vaccine to the people. 
in my opinion, the original agenda was, let me get this vaccine out so I can be the hero at election time because mm -hmm. I got this vaccine out to save you all's lives. So you should vote for me because I really pushed it through. And unfortunately that backfired because he did not get reelected and the vaccine was not ready at the time of election. So then it made people, particularly people of color, start thinking, well, why is Trump pushing this vaccine? He must be trying to kill us. There must be something wrong with this vaccine because Trump is trying to get it out there. And so then you have the rest of the naysayer world who can come in and, and attach to that vulnerable mind who's already thinking something's wrong with it because this particular uh, president is trying to push it. So then they can come in and say, oh, yeah, it's got poison. It's got microchips. Oh, yeah, you shouldn't take mm -hmm. vaccines. It's going to cause your children. It's going to cause you to have abortions. You know, when you're already doubtful about something, it doesn't take much for the other other elements to get in there and really pull you away from it. And it's very hard for the scientific community Poor Dr. Fauci. I used to work up there where he worked. You know, they just abused the man. I, you know, I think about like, like, you know, that he's just trying to help people and people are abusing him, you know, and, and it was it's taken a lot to try and undo some of all of that, that politics has really um, gotten in the way of this. And not only there, even with how the CDC operates, they tell you one thing one minute and by later that afternoon, they pulled back from it. And it's because of politics, because somebody picked up the phone and said, hey, I don't like what you just said, and I need you to retract that. So they would retract it, you know, by later that afternoon. And so science was not allowed to be conducted the way science was supposed to be conducted in this country. And I think all of that has gotten us all off on the wrong foot with these vaccines, because they're no different than the the flu and the measles and mumps and polio and all the other vaccines, like you said, that sure. we had, you know, since we were kids. Sure. What's in smallpox vaccine? I can't tell you to this day what's in smallpox vaccine or the flu shot. You just roll up your arm and you get it. That's right. And I actually, I'll actually take that political theme a step further because I think there are people who have a vested interest in people being sick and dying all because it makes the current administration look bad. Um, it's people, there There are winners in this. Um, there, there are large corporations that are making a lot of money with supply. So I think keeping people sick um, is a way to really, again, make the current president look bad. And so I worry about people being used as pawns because they can't filter the information um, and make decisions for themselves, but are just listening to people who are probably vaccinated and boosted, tell them not to get it. Not to. Right, definitely. There, there is something to be said of the capitalism of this mm -hmm. entire process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that many of us have to go and pay for a rapid test or uh, a test from the drugstore. Uh, I, I mean, and that's hard to do when, when you're trying to manage. If you're not buying your regular meds, then it's just hard to do. Uh, and, and you know, just the whole fact of that, the, the capitalism, but also the socialism part of it, where uh, people were labeled lazy because they didn't want to go to work or, or whatever the case may be. And so there's a lot of moving parts. But again, you know, it always hits the African-American community harder than it does any other community. Um, you know, they, the, the old adage, uh, when, when the other neighborhoods catch a cold, the African-Americans catch pneumonia. And, and it's really uh, ravaging us uh, because it really affected everything. It affected the, the jails where they could no longer put people in. So, you know, when we're out doing outreach, we, we see people with, uh, with the bracelets on their ankles and they're living in the streets and, you know, they're supposed to have, so they, they, they couldn't take them into the jails. And so it, it just kind of hit, uh, and not, not to mention the homeless population. Uh, we, um, we're looking at the, the data, but they haven't fleshed out the data, how many people have died that were just plain homeless. Uh, and so there's just a lot of moving parts there.
Oops. Um, one at um, thank you, Reverend uh, Curry, um, and and sort of going back to um, the political uh, dimensions of this thing and the political implications. Um, one of the things that's interesting to me when I'm talking to people who are anti-vaxxers, who are um, just fervent anti-vaxxers, they get to the point where they're almost like angry and, and, and you know, shaking and almost to the point of violence. And it's like, they are wow, really? It, it, yeah, and it, it's very scary that um, folks are getting triggered to that point to where, you know, someone who you'd have a, you know, normally civil conversation with and you start talking and you're, you know, you're giving facts and it, and I'm like, okay, well, what are your facts? And it's like, where did you, you know, where did you get that from? And then they're like, oh no, you're wrong. You're wrong. And it, it's very scary because, um, you know, and a lot of those people, I dare say, um, who are that violent anti-vaxxers tend to have weapons too. <laughs> yes. They tend to be yes. some of the same people that are, sure. you know, concealed carry type people. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm not, not trying to generalize, but I'm just saying, based on my experience, and I'm in um, Stone Mountain, Georgia, and um, yeah, I'm I'm right on the Gwinnett DeKalb line, so I get a variety of people and opinions. But the anti-vaxxers, they, they're scary. Sure. They are. You know, going back to the Christian aspect of it, I I uh, rectify that situation with something in the Bible, which I never understood before. But um, when when Christ, when God said in the Bible that He hardened the hearts of people, like He hardened the hearts of the Egyptians, because He wanted to He wanted to prove something. He He sort of did not want the Egyptians to let the Israelites go because He needed to show them how powerful. He was. So he hardened their hearts so that they would not let them go. And I always used to think that was so unfair. I was like, God, why'd you do that? Maybe he would have just let them go and it would have been all great. So I tend to believe in my minimal knowledge that God has hardened the hearts and the minds of people because it doesn't make any sense. That's the only way I can make sense yeah. of it. You know, there's this horrible infectious disease. My neighbor's school, they're out of school because over 100 people have COVID or exposure, but they want mask mandate. That makes no sense to me. That's like saying there's radiation in the air and you want mask mandate that people need to wear a mask to keep from being radiation poisoned. So I have to think there's something greater than mankind that's involved here. There's got to be some demons or spirits or something. Yes. And I really believe mm. that God has hardened the minds and the hearts of these people so that he can work what he is intending to work uh, with this pandemic. And God is not through with it yet. And sure. when he's through and when he's ready, this pandemic's on to end as quick as it started. And mm -hmm. like the, the flu pandemic of 1918, nobody thinks about it anymore, but it killed more people than COVID did. Yes. But but it, it moved on. This whole idea of Amen. patriotism Amen. Uh, this whole idea of patriotism uh, and uh, guns and all of this stuff that, you know, these these narratives that were, you know, how can you make me do something? And right. then that's the argument there. I mean, you know, first of all, if everyone would have masked from the beginning, we would probably be on the end of this thing. By mm -hmm. now. Uh, that's number one. Number two, though, you know, you're almost villainized. If you wearing a mask, I mean, people are looking at you, but, you know, and then there's inconsistencies in businesses where you go. Me and my wife were dining at Old Charlie's just the other day, and the lady didn't have a mask on it. She was getting close to us, you know, like, you know, and then so they, they almost like make you think, you know, like you're paranoid because, you know, there's there's nothing really going on. And so it, it's it's uh all this liberty stuff that, you know, you're going to take away my guns and take away my liberties and, you know, that take away my freedoms. I, I, I suggest and I adhere to that, you know, you all of us do possess liberties, but you don't have the liberty 
to infect somebody else. Exactly. Okay. So but we've that, always mandated vaccines. This is not new. There are restaurants that say no shoes, no shirts, no service. You can't come in their restaurant looking any kind of way. You can't go into a an upscale restaurant wearing, wearing flip flops and your bikini. So why is this any different? Why why suddenly is there more uh, importance put on people's rights right now? You know, I, as I tell people all the time, we have laws. And you can't do what you want to. You can't break the law. The law says you can't ride 100 miles an hour down the, the middle of town. That's the law. And you can't do it. Yes, you have a right to drive your car. You bought it. You have you put the gasoline in it. You have a right to do what you want to with it. But the law says you cannot. No, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. It, it's very scary. What was that? <laughs> But, you know, I, I don't understand people. I, I, I really don't. You know, the why they feel so strongly about this, other than what I already said, just it doesn't make any sense. Kim, you've been you've been quiet and I know you got something to say. On the well, subject. What? If I tell, didn't tell already, people. I'll tell you I'm one of those scary anti-vaxxers. And are you, be afraid because here okay. I am. Okay. Um, and I, <laughs> so I felt like what a privilege, right? White liberals who have the good luck of educating themselves in various ways can have the luxury of saying, oh, no, not for my child. They're not safe enough. They're not tested well enough. Um, we do have uh, autoimmune stuff in my family and autism in my family, much more than I knew at the time that I had my kid. And I did, of course, have to go to work. So she had to get vaccinated at some point. I just tried to hold it back as long as I could so that she could build up her immunities uh, or whatever's be as strong as possible before she got those um, shots. And with the, uh, this is just me personally, and I think that I'm not supposed to be talking about myself, Vicki has a question for me, but uh, I asked my daughter about it. She was only 17 at the time. And I said, what are you going to do if they come out with a vaccine? And she said, I'm going to get it. It is our obligation to contribute to herd immunity. And then as time and as time wore on, I realized that I was sick and tired of not seeing my people. And the only way I was going to get to see my people is if I got a vaccination. So that's, that's my, that's my scary anti-vaxxer talking. And then I will, um, I will mute. I've just really enjoyed hearing everyone's perspective. I thought that video was pretty fine too. Oh, and let me apologize. I have a laptop that will not play this wonderful stream. That's why I've been so rudely turning aside, trying to get my laptop to, to play it for us. But I'm just, I've decided to focus on, I'm going to just focus on us and not worry about that anymore. So I'm so happy to see everybody. Thank you for your perspectives. Well, I'm going to say a couple of times. I think yeah, Vicky was on mute. Yeah. I'm muted. Not anymore. Uh, okay. Okay. I, I, for some reason, I have dropped off a couple of times. So I, I'm glad you all have kept this going. Vernon is my co host. So thank you, Vernon. Um, can you all hear me? We can hear yes. you. Okay. All right. Vicky's having technical difficulties. I'm on now. Can you hear me? Up. Yes. Yes. Okay, so I was going to uh, shift gears. Hopefully you all haven't talked about this already, but um, I wanted to find out what you all think about uh, government entities, businesses, um, um, asking people to get vaccinated, you know, making it mandatory. Um, you know, because I work in a hospital, uh, I know that several of the employees at, well, I. I I actually work at a hospital that is a it's under an umbrella where there are 15 to 16 uh, healthcare facilities, and we are, you know, it, from the CEO, we have gotten a notification that everybody is going to be vaccinated. Period, or you lose your job. And this is by um, 
I'm sure you all have heard about this mandate from in the healthcare industry. Um, I believe you have to have the two doses by February 28th. And I have, uh, not just at my hospital, but just other hospitals in this area. I know I, I'm in Tennessee. I know that some people are willing to lose their jobs instead of get vaccinated. So again, I, I'm not sure, I, since I dropped off a couple times, I don't know if you've already addressed this, but uh, if you have not, let, let's talk about that. What do y'all think? <laughs> We haven't talked about that yet. Okay. And I feel that a, a business, that's a one, a private <coughs> business, you have a right to require what you want in your business because the business loses money when their employees are out sick. They cannot make they cannot make money that way. And I think if it is your private business, you have a right to require people to comply with what you want to in your business. Now, hospitals have required employees to have flu vaccines for a gazillion years. They've required that people cannot smoke. You got to take tests to show there's no nicotine in your bloodstream. Why all of a sudden is this vaccine so different? Children have been required to get vaccines to go to school. And honestly, I'm just going to put it out there. If the parents had gotten vaccinated to protect their communities like they were asked to, the government wouldn't have had to turn around and, and make it mandatory for children because the parents would have done it. So if the parents won't do it, then okay, we'll do the children. And, and honestly, the way it works is ultimately the parents will die off because they're not vaccinated, they'll get sick, but you've protected these children. So that's why vaccines are kind of, um, centered on children's because when you can't get the adults to take vaccines, you can get the children to take vaccines. So I believe that when you are in a community, again, it's like the herd of cows. If you want to live in a community, you have to do what it takes to live in the community. As I, as I say in my videos, be a hero, take a shot for your community. You may not want it for your body, you want it for this community. You want to be able to live in a neighborhood. We're communal people. Even God said it's not good that man should be alone. We're communal people. We need to live around each other. We go to church. We go to schools. We go to grocery stores. And if you want to be in a community, you need to comply with the rules of the community. If you don't want to be, that's perfectly fine. If you want to take your body and live at the top of Mount Everest or in a forest, away from everybody else, you have that right. But you should not expect to get the rights and privileges of living in a community if you don't want to comply with the rules. I mean, even back in the days where tuberculosis was heavy, they would come in your house and drag you out of your house and put you in a sanitarium so that you didn't spread tuberculosis all over the community. You don't have a right to infect other people. That's the, the bottom line. You have a right to not want to take drugs in your body. You absolutely have that right. You do not have to wear a mask if you don't want to. You don't have to get a vaccine. You don't have to take medicine for your, your mental illness so that you don't kill people. You don't have to, but you can't live in the community if you don't want to do that. I mean, you, you, I mean, that's just the bottom line. I understand people's rights. They do have a right, but you don't have a right to give me COVID because you refuse to take a vaccine. You don't have a right to give me measles. You don't have a right to give me um, the flu. You don't have a right to do those things to me because you want to sit in a cubicle next to me, but you don't want to be vaccinated. And I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, my, one of my mid-levels that I work with was pregnant. She was 30, 30 weeks pregnant. Her sister, she already had a three-year-old. Her sister was a school teacher. The school teacher had a assistant, what do you, you call paras, who refused to be vaccinated. She was an anti-vaxxer. So the para, still coming to school every day, infected the sister, who's a teacher, with COVID. The sister babysat my PA's little three-year-old, and the three-year-old got COVID. My PA was pregnant and she got COVID. And there is a very high mortality rate for mothers who get COVID. The babies survive, but the mothers will die. Did that para have a right to devastate an entire family? If my PA had died, she and her unborn son would have died. That would have devastated her husband. 
It would have devastated her little three-year-old. It would have devastated me because she's my PA. It would have devastated my entire organization. Did that para have the right to devastate an entire family? No, she didn't. She had a right not to take a vaccine, but she did not have a right to ruin people's lives. So if she didn't want to take a vaccine, she should have left the school. She should have moved away and got a boathouse and lived out on the ocean away from everybody. And that I feel, I feel strongly, I feel strongly about that. Dr. I, Ferguson, we need you here in Tennessee. I, I mean, I, I experienced people in rooms, in patients' rooms, where a patient might have cancer or something. They already they have you know a weakened immune system, and people, patient, uh, family members are in these rooms, unmasked. A lot of people are unvaccinated. And I'm like, what are you all doing? I, I feel like I have become the vaccination how, and mask police at my hospital. How selfish these people are! To me, that's the only way I can see it. You are selfish. You don't want to get vaccinated, but you want to go to grandma's house. You know grandma has heart failure and diabetes and COPD, but you have a right to go visit grandma, and you're going to, you're going to belittle her and make her feel bad because she doesn't want you to come in her house. It, it almost brings me to tears. I'm sitting here. This just it kills me. It kills me. I see it every day. Every well, day. Now the big thing in Virginia, the new governor relaxed the mask mandate for schools. So the parents were showing up with children who were unmasked, insisting that they be allowed inside, incensed that the school put them in an auditorium. Didn't understand why. Yeah, we understand why. It's because your children are potentially infectious to the whole school community. So that's where they're gonna stay until they come with a mask. Because as right. Dr. Ferguson said, it's a community issue and you don't have a right to inf infect other people. And I think that I love Kim, how you said that your family, you wanted to see your family, you were tired of being isolated. And I think it's gonna take that level of um, relationships to help those people who can continue to be um, resistant because when they did the, the data on people who eventually changed their mind, it's one, talking to trusted health professional and two, family pressure. So I think that that is a place that we really have to focus, getting family members to ask their loved ones to be vaccinated before they interact. Because again, they're protecting themselves, they're protecting the community. Um, so it's interesting, Kim, that that was what finally made you get over your reluctance. And then here's the other thing, even with the flu, do you know in the flu pandemic of 1918, 50 million people yeah. died. We did not have vaccines back then. That's 50 million who we know died from the flu. Another 50 million were buried in unmarked graves and mass graves. They don't know why they died. We didn't have a vaccine. People were still, you can go back in history on the internet and Google it. There are people standing with signs, anti-mask, we don't want to be forced to wear masks. We want to socialize. We want to congregate. And you know what? When you look back at it way back then, it was all for nothing. All for nothing. We have a flu vaccine. It was developed in 1945. I mean, 40-something years later, people protested for absolutely no reason. We had the vaccine. People don't die in the millions from flu anymore because we have a vaccine. Very few people die every year from the flu and it was all worthless. And that's gonna be now. These 5 million people will have died for nothing. And let me make it plain. They didn't die because some bat bit them. They died because another person killed them with their COVID. Right. When they died from COVID, somebody killed them, period. Somebody killed them. And if those people had been kind enough to suck it up and get a vaccine for somebody else, those people wouldn't have died. And, and I tell, I told my nurse's son, who she's 70 something years old, he wouldn't get vaccine. I said, you know what? If you give your mother COVID and she dies, I'm gonna hound you for the rest of your life because it's your fault. You're not only telling her not to get a vaccine, you're unvaccinated and think you got a right to come visit her. If she gets sick and dies, I'm gonna call you and I'm gonna tell you every day, your mama died because of you, because that is a fact. All right, I, I believe the question too was, um, 
What about the government? What do we think about the government and their mandates? You know, I don't like everything the government does and everything the government tells us to do, but I think at, at the heart of what they're doing, they're trying to protect the public. You know, the government exists for our general welfare. They exist to provide public safety, you know, not necessarily to please us and let us do what we wanted to do. If every one of us could do anything we wanted to do when we wanted to do, we have mad hair. Yeah, you know, somebody world. has to be the adult in the room. And I hate to say that uh, in this case, our government needs to be big brother and, uh, and have a certain set of rules for us to live by. You know, we all have rights, but you know, your rights end where mine begin. And I don't want your COVID. Right. Good point. I, I think I think with that as well, but um, with with the political realm, um, you know, if you look at it uh, again, uh, they're not necessarily to be trusted. Uh, again, I mean, you know, they they're not coming together. They're not, you know, everything is a political issue, uh, but it's it's not really hitting them as hard because they have access to. The things that are going on which leads me to my other point you know i mean people are watching these these athletes and and watching these people you know the aaron Rodgers, the you know uh, and now uh they're saying now that kyrie irving can play he just has to do a fine you know but what what they're not what a lot of people are missing is is that they have access to tests yeah. At, at you know that we don't have access to okay right. so again it's again it becomes capitalism again where you know they have for their inter- for their entertainment so and it's uh it's frustrating to say the least uh, so we have to uh, educate ourselves uh, and and ensure that you know, that we're doing the best for our community in spite of uh, the people that have the uh, the stewardship of taking care of us or looking over us when they want. I wanted to mention something about the government, and I know you're going to mention it later, um, in, the, in the trust factor of trusting the, the government and people. For some reason, you know, they bring up the Tuskegee Institute study and they kind of blame that on the government. The government was experimenting on people. Well, it wasn't actually the government who conducted that um, um, study in which uh, 400 African-American men who had syphilis and no, the government did not give them syphilis. They had syphilis. And even though we had a treatment for it, which was penicillin, they denied those men that penicillin because they wanted to see what the long term course of syphilis was going to be. Um, What people don't realize is one, the government did not conduct that study, but it was the government who stepped in and corrected that situation uh, more or less. Um, It was, you know, 40 years later for the whistle was blown as actually what happened in the syphilis study, but it was organizations like the National Institutes of Health who looked at those kind of atrocities and said, look, we need more rules and regulations when it comes to the conduct of, of human research. You know, And they had been working on this actually for years. African-Americans, and I'm gonna just sit it out there, African-Americans were not the first people experimented on. I mean, you know, back in the 30s, um, the Nuremberg uh, trials were because Nazi doctors were experimenting on prisoners. I mean, they were doing all kinds of things, just cutting off their legs and blinding them and injecting them with poison. Those were not all African-Americans that that was happening to. You know, uh, Native Americans and other people have been experimented on in time. And over the years, the government has stepped in, you know, even great institutions, um, academic institutions did experiments on people. And it's the government, like with the NIH, when they developed their clinical center, that they said, you know what, we need some policies, we need some rules about the conduction of research, not just um, um, in racial groups, but women, pregnant women, um, uh, live fetuses, children, prison. They used to do research on prisoners. They would just do whatever they wanted to to prisoners. So I, I love to quote a Bible verse, and I can't 
quote it, what if you ministers will do better than me? But it's Genesis 50, 20 that says, what you intended for harm for me, God intended for good. And what, you know, most people just stop right there with it. But actually the rest of the verse says, so that now more people will live, more people will be better. So what you intended to harm me, God intended for my good so that many more people would benefit from it. So even with that Tuskegee study that was meant to harm us, all of these new rules and regulations and, and different types of codes, the IRB, Institutional Review Board that reviews clinical research, all of that got heightened and strengthened because of studies like Tuskegee. So rather than me sit back whining about it and throwing it in people's face every time they want to talk about research, because I worked at NIH for five years, so I, I, um, I provided uh, grant funds for, for research. So rather than you know throwing that up in people's face all the time, I said, look, it was not a good thing that happened, but look at the good that came from it. You know, if it hadn't happened, we might not have had the IRB. We might not have had these different uh, codes and, and policies that help to protect human subjects um, in research. So I, I really just want people to stop talking about Tuskegee, honestly, <laughs> because that, that should not stop us from moving forward with clinical research, because that's really the only way that you learn um, uh, a, that you can test the different things that you need to 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 advance medical science. Uh, Vernon is from that area. Vernon, do you have any any comments about the Tuskegee? Um, well, actually, just an amen to Dr. Ferguson again. Um, <laughs> and I'm next door um, in Montgomery. That's where I grew up. So. Oh, okay, cool, cool, um, and. Um, you know, I, when you when you was talking about that, you you triggered me thinking about Henrietta Lacks, and even though they took advantage, look how much has happened in terms of medicine because of what they did, the bad that they did, the the unethical that they did, the good that came out of that as well. Right. And uh, you know, you being from Montgomery, I I. Um, Fred Gray Sr., who was the attorney that actually um, prosecuted the case, um, I just... My uncle's I, in that I, firm, I, Say in Lankford. Say is my oh, uncle. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, okay, attorney Say. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, but yeah, it's, it's sitting down and talking with Mr. Gray, um, just asking questions was amazing um and you know like you said you know who actually prosecuted you know who actually did the deed did the dirty deed and what actually happened um that was actually a couple here in atlanta area where the husband had gone to tuskegee grad school and his rationale for not getting the vaccine and the vaccine was available was the Tuskegee experiment and he subsequently died and his yeah. wife died maybe four or five days later and they left two beautiful kids. Um, no, I'm sorry. Correction. His wife didn't die because she didn't listen to him about the Tuskegee um, experiment, but he passed. And, you know, it, it's like, you know, like you said, okay, time out for, I get it you know, understand what actually happened. And so many people get it confused. It's like, no, they didn't give them syphilis, y'all. <laughs> exactly. They didn't. It's like, so. Mm. This, um, Dr. Ferguson, you mentioned Genesis 50, 20. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I Googled the new international version and it reads, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, you know, I'm looking at, at the screen here, and I, I mean, we have a couple physicians on here. I'm a minister. Um, Reverend Curry's a minister. You know, we are out here trying to save lives, but yet we have all these rebellious people or fearful people not doing what they should be doing, um, trying to protect themselves as well as other people. I mean, how, how, do, how are we going to coexist with 
with people who are just adamant about, uh, you know, not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, you know, we, we can try to educate people, but if they're not going to listen, how are we going to get get through this? I mean, actually, I, I'm I'm a bit cynical because it's a sad fact of life that we're not turning the corner. Just when we thought we turned the corner from Delta, here comes Omicron. And we right. really have to continue to get the messaging out. And again, Henrietta Lacks is real. Tuskegee is real. So we have to recognize that people's mistrust comes from a place and then talk to them in plain and simple language and say, okay, go to people who you trust. Now I say people, I feel like I'm a physician because God blessed me with the ability to master all of that information and God blessed me and put me out here so that I can come and spread a message of truth. So you, I'm not asking you to trust just any old person. I'm saying trust me because I have been trustworthy the whole time that you know that exactly. you know I've known you and I think even the clergy I mean that's again many people trust their clergy so they may not listen to any old body because I tell you quite frankly I've been doing church on my laptop it is not as fulfilling but it's safe right. so I took myself in for a special occasion and I'm seeing people in there unmasked and I'm imagining all the COVID germs coming around me. So I, I had to sit in the last row in the corner like nobody come near me. So I had to say, OK, Pastor, I will be happy to do some education, to answer questions, to do a webinar because they trust you. They can trust us together. And so I really think clergy have an important role in being that trusted person bringing trusted people from the community in to talk in plain language, plain, simple language. It's like Dr. Ferguson said, if you don't get vaccinated, you will be responsible for killing X, Y, and Z. And really break it down in a way that people understand versus giving up. Because some days I'm hope I'm hopeless. I mean, I work for a health plan. We're trying to get our members immunized. We're currently at 40%. We've provided gift cards, transportation, and still... You know, so it's easy to give up, but I think that there is an end. It's just not as close as it could be. Um, and we just have to continue to fight the misinformation. And we have to keep studying ourselves. I, I learned so much because I had to do a, a talk for ACP, I think it was ACP on uh, diversity um, in the COVID pandemic or something like that. And that is where I discovered Dr. Kismia Corbett. I mean, I, I was floored by the fact that a young African-American woman helped develop the Moderna vaccine. I mean, I had no idea. There was nobody to tell me that, you know, but when I found out that a young black woman actually was on the, the floor, the groundbreaking research for the Moderna messenger RNA vaccine, um, you know, I could, I could tell people, look, a black woman helped develop this. They're not trying to kill you. She didn't make anything that is going to kill you. And, um, you know, the more I, I had to read for myself, you know, people talked about, oh, they just made this vaccine starting last year. They made it too fast. Well, that is just absolutely not true. We've been working on a vaccine against COVID for about 20 years. And people don't, people don't realize that. And if, and if you don't read and learn something for yourself, like these doctors out here who are telling people crazy things as well, Go read something. Go go read. Don't just go by what you feel and what you think. Because honestly, I was not taking that COVID vaccine initially. And my brain told me it was made too fast and I don't know what's in it. But I wasn't going to tell my patients that based on my little brain telling me I'm going to go find the facts so that I can tell my patients factually whether I believe it or not. I'm going to tell them the facts. So I started doing all of that research. And, and those were two things that I discovered that were amazing, how long we have actually been working on this vaccine, um, really almost since they discovered the coronavirus itself, which is the common cold, um, and Dr. Uh, Kismikia Corbett. I mean, you all can, can Google her. She is an amazing young woman. She started out at NIH. She's at Harvard now, African-American mm -hmm. woman in her 30s. Okay, so Dr. Ferguson, as you talked, it sounds to me like we might have an issue that's beyond a public health issue. It sounds like it's a messaging and marketing issue. 
you know, doctors are put on this earth to heal us. They're not put on this earth to market and persuade and all of that good stuff. It seems to me that we need to have um, better marketing and um, different spokespeople who can reach those hard to reach. That is yeah. that is absolutely true. And, and we have to be better listeners as physicians. I used to just, you all can tell how, I'm actually an introvert, whether you all believe it or not, but I could become an extrovert. We're, we're all laughing, Dr. Curtis. <laughs> Something that I am uh, interested in. So when a patient would tell me I don't want to be vaccinated like Miss Kim here, I'll just jump on them. Right, I'm 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 in there pounding and fighting, you know. And but I had to stop and say, okay, well, why don't you want to be vaccinated? I have to stop and I have to listen and I have to address their concern. It doesn't matter what I think and blah blah blah. What is your concern? If your concern is a a trust issue, or if your concern is uh, the issue with autism and, and vaccines. I got an answer for that too, Kim. Or uh, if your issue, whatever your issue I look is, forward to defending myself. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to, but um, the, the reality is though, that the, the doctor, and again, it was a doctor who brought out that research about vaccines causing autism. It was falsified research and it was retracted. But once you put something in the internet, it's there forever. It's there forever. So once the people read that initial information, vaccines cause autism, it was in their mind forever. It didn't matter that it was retracted from, uh, from view. It didn't matter that it was not in peer reviewed articles. It was retracted, but people still held on to it. And there's little you can, there's little you can really do about that other than try and, and educate people uh, about it. But I, that is the most important thing that I found. Listen, listen to my patient. Let them first tell me what their concerns are and then try and address their, con their concern about it. Okay, for, uh, I wanna ask actually uh, both physicians on here, uh, since you both are actively practicing, what is your, uh, it sounds like, well, one is in Georgia and one is in Virginia. What, so in your practices, what is the percentage of Caucasian patients versus people of color? Um, I live in rural Albany, Georgia. Georgia is 80% African American. Um, and so, you know, my practice is 80, is 80%, uh, um, African American, Hispanic. We do have Caucasians. We're predominantly Medicare, Medicaid, and uninsured, uh, people down here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Everett. So let me correct. I don't see patients. I work for a health plan. We work with okay. federally qualified community health centers and we are out, you know, advocating. And when we actually don't have that data racially broken down, but we look at our zip codes um, and we see that the lowest percentage of um, the lowest rates of vaccination are in the rural areas. Um, some of them are populated by Caucasians, um, but we see clusters in the inner city. So I think that, again, it's more imperative for people of color who suffer from many lifestyle illnesses, hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, which makes their COVID, as was said, you know, it makes their COVID the pneumonia. Um, yeah. So, but certainly we advocate people of all colors, all ages, um, all disciplines to get that vaccination. We do know that there's less vaccination in red states than there are in blue states. But one thing I wanted to mention, which people don't really know, realize, is that the higher COVID rates and deaths are actually in the Native American communities. It's not yeah, the Native American community, it's, it's Native Americans. But what's interesting about that is Native Americans also have the highest vaccination right. rates. They are dying and they're getting sick, but somebody's getting to them and you know, as as down to earth and and non whatever as Native Americans are, they're getting vaccinated. They're not they're not afraid of vac of, of vaccines. And so, um, I discovered that along the way. So really, it's between uh, Hispanics and African Americans. You know, at some point we're up, some point we're down. But uh, for the most part, in terms of uh, cases and deaths, um, it's Native Americans first, and then. Um, African Americans, but based on their population size, Native Americans get more vaccines than anybody. Okay, mm -hmm. Dr. Ferguson, what role does genetics 
play in our ability to fight off this disease? Do you think that um, there's something happening at play genetically with Native there Americans? Is. There is definitely something that we don't know. Because you remember in the beginning, they said it's older people, it's sicker people, the kids don't have to worry about it. The young adults don't have to worry about it. And we slowly realized that that was not the case. And so I have an 85 year old man with heart disease, COPD, you name it, he's got it. And he beat it. He walked out of the hospital. Um, he was never put on a ventilator. He does have oxygen. But then I've also had a 30 year old uh, patient who was a weightlifter and as healthy as an ox, as we know, but he died from COVID. So there is some element to this that we uh, don't understand. I think our immune system is involved. Perhaps there is some genetic um, mutation or variable or something. And we're going to be studying COVID for years to come before we sort all of this out. You know, I've always said, um, when I think about it, when, when, when the scientists or whoever say, this is the way this is, God said, nope, that's not it. And we'll say, oh, yeah, you, oh, you don't have to wear a mask. God says, nope, that's not it. We say, oh, it's only the old people. God says, nope, that's not it. No matter what we come up with, it doesn't take long before we realize that that's not the case at all. So there's, there's definitely um, something about COVID. Um, we do know things like um, there is some research that suggests that low vitamin D um, mm -hmm. attributes to uh, people's risk for getting COVID. And, and dying from it. And there's a suggestion that because African-Americans naturally have a lower vitamin D level, that that is why we're more susceptible to COVID. It's not really anything genetic per se, um, you know, because believe it or not, African-Americans are 99% genetically the same as Caucasians in this country. They don't, you know, they may not, but that is, that is the truth. Tribes in Africa are more genetically distinct from each other than African Americans and Caucasians are in this country. So it's not a genetic thing. There's some other socioeconomic, it's it's cultural, it's you know, vitamin D, vitamin C, you know. I don't I don't know. I'm I'm just sitting here abiding my time till God decides it's over. Yeah, but well, you know, I think it's oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to jump in on that about when you said the social factor, because there are things we call the social determinants of health, where you yeah. live, where you work, um, your neighborhoods, your, whether you live in a food desert. And I think those really impact people of color so that we don't have access to good health care. We don't have access to clinical trials. We don't have access to healthy food so that our bodies are strong to fight things. And I think that plays a big part which is also yeah. why it, as we think of the politi politicization of it all, I think there's some people think that people, indigent people are dispensable. So that yeah. since the virus impacts those communities, there's less of a concern about eradicating it. Because if you have money, you have access to early access to the COVID drugs. So it's really complicated. Yeah, the genetic piece, but the social determinants of health. I mean, that's that's a whole show right there, yeah. um, and the way it impacts certain communities, yeah. which leads them to have disproportionate disease burden. Yeah, I mean, even if you think of African Americans are ones who work as CNAs in nursing homes, we're mm -hmm. we're, we're in the face of COVID Correct. all the time. We can't work from home. Our jobs don't allow a janitor to work from home. You got to go to school right. and be around all these kids not wearing masks. You got to go to a nursing home where they did not have enough PPEs in the beginning. You know, you're the the um, people's doormats or whatever you want to call it. Down here, we have the chicken plants. You know, the, the big right. chicken yeah. factories where you're, you're standing like, you know? face to face and side to side as these chickens are coming down the conveyor belt. You know, and people are breathing COVID across the, the aisle all day long. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, the folks at Walmart, you know, they're standing there dealing with the unmasked people um, all day long. It's, 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 uh, it's definitely socioeconomic. You know, I can retreat into my house and stay here and live forever and just order out. But most you know, people can't do that. Well, uh, you know, I, uh, like I have told um told everybody i live in east tennessee and kim actually lives in the same city i live in 
Um, and I, I have talked to Kim. Kim and I are friends. You know, I'm black. She, she's Caucasian. Uh, you know, I, I have talked to her and I, you know, I am deeply puzzled here. Um, you know, I, I work in a hospital where there are mostly Caucasian patients. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of, quite a few of them are the ones coming in with, with COVID and a lot of them are dying. But then when I go to the post office here or the grocery store or just anywhere running errands, I see a lot of them walking around unmasked unmasked and I'm not you know when I'm in the hospital I have talked to some pa uh, patients visitors and said you really need to have on your masks here it's a requirement but when I'm out and about in the community I'm not going to approach people and say you know what why aren't you wearing a mask please do it because we all know there are a lot of mentally ill people and, and I mean violent people so I'm not going to do that but I just it, it is just amazing to me how many Caucasians here in this area are walking around as if there is no pandemic. And so I, I have often wondered, and I have not asked them, but I've wondered, do Caucasian people feel like this is a, a black people's disease or a disease for people of color, period, not just black people? It, it's just amazing to me. They, there A lot of them, not all, a lot of them are walking around here as if there's just nothing going on, business as usual. I often wonder if, if we told them that a nuclear bomb had exploded somewhere in the Atlantic and we have radiation in the atmosphere and you need to wear a mask, would they say I have a right not to wear a mask then? Kim, I think you're <laughs> muted. Probably. You're muted. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> I just said probably. I mean, some of us are just that way. Yeah. Well, some of us are some of us are just that way too. There are African Americans walking around with no mask on and Absolutely. I agree. It's it's a matter of just they just don't want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with the uh COVID or anything else. They just mm -hmm. don't want someone to tell them what to do. That's so they'd rather risk their lives then. That, that's then amazing. The, the, the value of your own life doesn't mean anything, and then you don't yeah. care if you kill other people. That's well, when you think of parents who are, fighting, who are fighting so their kids don't have to wear masks, you're fighting so that your child is not protected. You're mm -hmm. fighting to not protect your child's health. That just seems kind of crazy. But yeah. it's all about still being you know, told not, you know, what not to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's a sign of the times. I think this generation is much more rebellious than we were. And I think we were more rebellious than our own parents. You know, our parents might have been a little bit more compliant, but I, I think with every newer generation comes more rebelliousness. And I think some of that is stoked by the political environment that's kind of tapped into that but I, I think people who are more compliant for the most part they're either older sicker or they're dead um you, you've got a younger group that's not willing to to follow the same rules that older people are willing to follow and i, I don't think it's going to get any better and i think it's going to impact not only our public health but everything else in our society and this, this is a good, uh, at, at, we're at a good point to kind of segue to the last part of this. We have about 10 minutes left. I'm trying to be cognizant of the time. I'm trying to end right on time. So it's 8.50, you have 10 more minutes. Um, Reverend Curry, if you, you know, I, I'm gonna have you lead this off. Um, you know, uh, Valerie was just talking about how uh, it seems like a lot of the younger people are the rebellious ones. <laughs> Um, I, I know from being in ministry, you know this also that we are, um, you know, we are seeing less young people in church. And so, um, you know, like Valerie saying, this is a sign of the times. What, what do you think about that? Um, you know, we're, we're in this worldwide pandemic. Is this God trying to, to bring people to God or, you know, what is this all about? Well, first of all, I, I would say uh, this is not the first pandemic. 
Okay, mm-hmm. there was a thing called a plague in, in, right. in, in Egypt. Okay, and uh, and and they got through it. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think we we can learn from the lesson here of not necessarily what's going on, but how we apply our faith in everyday life, um, mm-hmm. which is uh, all over the place. First of all, the COVID will revolutionize and change church as we know it forever. Uh, because now, forever and ever, you'll have the liberty of never having to step foot in church uh, if you don't want to because of streaming and this and that. And uh, so that's one thing. Um, then you have folk that may not ever come back to church, uh, you know, and um, because of what's going on. And someone mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the lack of safety precautions that's going on in church. Um, that 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 plays a part as well. Uh, what I'm finding is that people who are grown do what they want to do, okay, and they do what's important to them. So, uh, I'll share this this story. Uh, I did a funeral for one of our members who had not been to church. I mean, excuse me, one of the members, family members, who had not been to church that in, for the entire time of COVID. Okay, so they came to church for the funeral and this and that. Still haven't come back to church. But when I look at Facebook, they're, they're at the club, you know, they, they, with no mask. I mean, they're hugging one another. And so there's really no logic to this thing. Uh, but to answer your question, it is a testing of our faith. Okay. Uh, it's, it's a testing of uh, the church is still the church in spite of um pandemics and things. And so it's really stretching uh, the church administration. Are you living from one Sunday to the next Sunday? Uh, Are you still conducting community ministry? Are you still taking care of the needs of those who stand in need? And so all these things are ringing true. I believe God has exposed us through the pandemic to try to get us, as he says, in, uh, in, 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 in Haggai to consider our ways uh, and, and to look at what's going on um, and find out that we really wasn't as spiritual as we thought we were. Uh, we really didn't have it all together as much as we thought we are because this is really stretching um, how we operate. So I would say that uh, in, in, the, in the religious community, again, no one else has shut down. Everybody else is doing their thing. Right. The bars are open. Yep. The nightclubs are still open. Man, they, I mean, you, yeah. you, I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan. They still, they're not in the playoffs anymore, but however, they do pack the stadium. The liquor store is never closed here. Liquor stores never close. For some reason, they decided people, it's a stressful environment, and they need liquor stores open. That that was amazing to me. I guess that's drinking your problems away, huh? I guess so. <laughs> uh, Vernon? Uh, so, but I mean, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I thought you were finished. Go ahead. You can go ahead. Then I was going to have No, Vernon I was just coming. saying it is. It, okay, I was just saying it, it is an indictment on many of our faith uh, that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we trust other organizations and entities versus uh, the church uh, that God said, upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So I just think it's it's an indictment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Vernon, you teach a, I believe you teach a Bible study on social justice and some other issues. What what are your comments about what's going on right now with this worldwide pandemic and people going around doing whatever they want to do? Um, hmm. <laughs> Following after Reverend Curry, amen to that also. But also going back to what uh, Dr. Ferguson said earlier, the whole thing um, that, you know, as she uh, reference the uh, Pharaoh narrative and how God hardened Pharaoh's heart and the people just Pharaoh's crazy. It was like, okay, so what? The plague, so what? The frog, so what? You know, 
And then even when he killed his son, even when he killed his firstborn, Pharaoh was like, okay. And it seems like um, people's hearts and minds, because I think when you were off, um, one of the things I was speaking, talking about was how people are so hostile when it comes to masking and all the people are just hostile to the point where it's scary, where you're like scared they're going to get violent with you. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's, it's definitely a spiritual, um, you know, what Reverend Curry um, said about um, folks, you know, the way church is done now, you know, it, even in my church, it will never be the same. Some folks will never go back to church, but, you know, ultimately God is allowing it to happen. God is allowing the sifting. God is, you know, separating the shafts from the wheat, from the tares, all the things that, you know, only he can do. And, and I definitely agree with you, Dr. Ferguson, when you said when it when it sort of kind of just ends, it's just going to end. And then it's going to be like, who's going to get the glory? I'm not going to be praising Dr. Fauci. I'm going to be dancing a praise of him. That's what I'm going to be, you know, saying God be at this because only God, God can end it to tomorrow if he wanted to, if he chose to. And that's all I got to say about that. Mm. Okay. We have about uh, two minutes left. So let's uh, start winding down. If you all have closing comments, um, Dr. Everett, do you have any closing comments for the viewers and other panelists? Just if there's anyone out there who has not yet been vaccinated, I hope you heard something that speaks to you. And certainly, again, because life has slowed down, hopefully you can hear and receive God's message about health and wellness. Thank you. Um, Kim, Owen, you closing I'll comment? pass for tonight. Um I will. I am so glad we're having this conversation. It seems like we could do it again. You know, there's a lot of complexities to this situation. I will, here's one thing I want to say. You cannot mandate a vaccine unless you make it easier for people to get the vaccine. If I have to take off of work to go get a vaccine, I can't. If I have to, if I have a bad reaction and I feel like I have the flu, for 24 or 48 hours after I got a shot, I can't miss work. Um, I'm, if I'm an hourly employee, uh, if I don't have the transportation. So do not, I'm happy to hear, uh, I don't know how I feel about the mandates because I do feel like people should have sovereignty over their own bodies, but don't mandate something that is going to force people to do things that will be detrimental to their home life if they're gonna get it done, such as miss work to go get the shot or miss work because they have the, you know, the normal whatever for 24, 48 hours after. It's really important to make it possible for people to do it. Time off with pay as needed. Okay, okay thank you. Um, Valerie, do you have any closing comments? I just wanna say thank you so much. Vicki and Vernon for inviting me to participate. I want to say thank you to all the other panelists for sharing your views. Um, it was really interesting. I, I learned a lot from hearing different perspectives and I really appreciate just being a part of it and say thank you. Okay, so I, let's see. So uh, Richard and Vernon, I don't know. I mean, you talked about the, the spiritual part, the religious part. Let me have um, Dr. Uh, Ferguson, go last. Uh, any closing comments? And then I'll, I'll say goodnight to everybody after you, Dr. Ferguson. Nope, just one. Be a hero. <laughs> Get vaccinated for your community. It's not about you. Thank That's you. Th okay. Thank you all. Thank you all so much, panelists. I appreciate each and every one of you all. Thank you, viewers, for watching. This was our first night on... Um, where we were actually on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So, and uh, thank you to my tech person. We will be back on, I don't have the date. Uh, we, we are going to be back in two weeks. So I think that's the 12th, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, 
But anyway, I, I always do promotions and, and we'll have new flyers and everything. So I will post them on social media. Um, if anybody could quickly tell me the date in two weeks, let's see, today is the 25th. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, February 8th. February 8th. Okay, that's two 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 uh Tuesdays from now. So okay, thank you, Vernon. Uh February so we will be back February 8th. I'm not sure what the topic will be, but again, I will be promoting it. Thank you so much, panelists. Thank you, viewers, for watching. I hope that everybody has got learned a lot and just thought a lot about our own lives and, and just our own selfishness and how we can do better and be better for other people and protect others. Thank you and good night. All right, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. All right.